Hi, welcome. Thanks for watching. I'm Casey Waugh. I am an occupational therapist from Pittsburgh. Right out of the gate, I want to make it very clear that I am not and will not pretend to be a registered dietitian. So this video is not going to talk about calories, weight gain, vitamin or nutrient deficiencies. What this video is, is going to guide you toward your best next steps. If you have a picky eater, you have a child on the verge of becoming a picky eater or a problem feeder. I've decided to cut my nutrition info into two videos. There's just a lot to cover. I don't want to make this a super long video and also it will give you some time to digest before we move on to real life recommendations. So today, what's the difference between picky eaters and problem feeders? What are some of the main causes of picky eating? And what are your next steps? This video is going to go right into my sensory processing disorder playlist, but last week I put out a video on sleep and in that video I introduced the four things that I recommend you kind of get a handle on if or if not you're seeing an occupational therapist for a sensory integration treatment or you're working with any other professionals. Um, these are four things that you can do at home now to start to give a foundation for the best possible success and support your child in all the work that they are doing every day with their special ed teachers, with their therapists, with you, with their siblings. So those things are sleep, nutrition, routines, and sensory rich play. Last week was sleep. This week is nutrition. Why does nutrition matter? I think deep down, we kind of all know the answer to this, but let's go there anyways. If your child is gaining weight, does it really matter if they eat Pop-Tarts and goldfish all day? If you are asking that question, you probably somewhere inside of you know that yes, it does matter. Weight gain and growth is not the only indicator of health and it obviously is also not the only indicator of good nutrition but if you are in a rhythm of pop tarts and goldfish every day getting out of that is is not easy even if you know in your core this is not what's best for my kid it's not just a matter of try harder and all of a sudden your child's gonna be eating broccoli and carrots and wanting to explore all of these foods. It, it's not that easy. What we eat and put in our body nourishes our cells, it supports our bodily functions, and it supports our brain function. In pretty much every video in the sensory processing series, I have talked about how sensory processing is a brain-based thing. Supporting the brain starts in your gut. Basically, what we eat impacts how we attend, how we focus, how we behave, how we sleep. All of these things are related to our gut. I am not saying that diet is going to fix any and everything. However, supporting your gut microbiome and the naturally occurring bacteria in your gut will help brain function. It's just science. Many, many, many kids with sensory differences struggle with mealtime. This is often one of the very first indicators that there's something else going on and how they interact with the world around them. Just like I said with the sleep video, Sensory processing impacts the food you eat and the food you eat impacts sensory processing. So I want to take that guilt that you may be feeling if you are a mom and you're saying, oh my, like I, I give my kid Pop-Tarts every morning because I know they will eat it and it's calories. I hear you and I feel for you. We are working together with a professional if needed to support trying and exploring new foods in the most appropriate way. You, the parent, if you're doing these things, you're not causing a sensory processing disorder or you're not causing 
sensory issues, but you're not helping it. So there's that support um, going hand in hand again. If we know that they don't want to touch these foods or they are really resistive, so we therefore avoid it to avoid meltdowns, we don't give them the opportunity to challenge themselves a little bit. We're constantly wiping, scraping, avoiding. We're not helping the issue um, and we are potentially hurting the issue by avoiding it altogether. Does that make sense? So just again, parents, you're not the cause of sensory processing disorder. You're not the cause of feeding issues, but without intentional support and opportunities to practice it safely and often, then, then you're not supporting the sensory system to progress. I hope that came out right. So my goal is to help you to look at some of the reasons behind picky eating and eventually give realistic ways to support your picky eater, to support optimal brain function in the long term. This is not a quick fix. If it was that simple, we wouldn't be here. So the first thing to discuss is picky eaters versus problem feeders. So the term picky eater um, includes kids who usually have um, around 30 foods or more. Problem feeders are kids who have 20 or less foods. When I talk about counting foods, I'm talking different varieties, different flavors, different brands. If you can eat Giant Eagle brand Pop-Tarts and name brand Pop-Tarts, that's two foods. If you eat strawberry Pop-Tarts, cinnamon sugar top pop tarts and s'mores pop tarts that's three foods so if you are like oh my gosh my child is definitely a problem feeder there's a chance that they are but you may be surprised when you actually sit down and write every single variety of food that they eat it's probably more than you think so now that we've teased out picky eater versus problem feeder the approaches are going to be the same However, a true problem feeder, a realistic goal is that you would add maybe one or two foods in an entire year. There are several different reasons why a child may restrict their diet, so I'm gonna talk about a few of them. The first two reasons I will go into have very clear next steps right after them. The next three, I will explain what they are, but the recommendations for those, that's gonna be a whole other video. The first, reason for picky eating that I'm going to address is an oral motor issue. That means that the child is not able to manage the food well in their mouth. They may not be able to chew it because they don't have the strength or their tongue is not moving well. So if that oral motor issue is not addressed when they're young, it could get better on its own, you know, with time and practice and development, but if a child can't manage a food well and they feel unsafe, even if those skills get better, that whole time of bad experiences with unsafe foods means that they're more likely to be a picky eater down the road. They have a bad experience and they've gotten stuck into a pattern of only accepting certain foods. So if you have a very young baby, toddler, even preschooler with um, feeding issues, I would start honestly with looking at oral motor skills. If they are avoiding entire food groups like meat, vegetables, and like harder fruits, all three of those, they're hard to chew. You can't just suck on it and mash it until it goes away. With carby um, bread type things, you usually can. You stick it in and it either melts or you can kind of mash it with your tongue and down it goes. But if you have um, a piece of steak, not gonna happen. You could leave it in your mouth as long as you want. It's not gonna dissolve. If you see an entire food group, particularly those three, missed, they have nothing in those three, it's probably an oral motor issue. Another way you can take a peek at this is if you look at how well they manage things with their hands. The tongue is a small muscle, so it is a fine motor movement. If they have a hard time picking up a small piece of food, they're not gonna manage it well in their mouth. So that is another way to look at it. With older kids, it's not as clear. So I'm talking um, in like under one to about two or even three. 
fine motor in their fingers is a good indicator of what's going on in their mouth. Past that, it, it gets a little bit more tricky because kids figure out how to do certain things, they adapt, and they just are generally progressing in a lot of different ways. So if you have an older child and you're thinking maybe uh, oral motor, these are some things to look out for. Chewing with their mouth closed and holding the food kind of in the front of their mouth. If you're chewing like this, they aren't moving it to their molars to chew. We may think, oh, they're so polite, but that is likely more that they are chewing at the front of their mouth, keeping their lips closed to prevent the food from falling out. If your child only chews on one side of their mouth, they're not nicely moving food from side to side. They always bite off on one side. That's an indication of maybe some imbalance in strength. If they take a really long time to finish a meal that they really like, a meal should take 30 minutes or less. If your child holds food in their mouth for prolonged periods of time, you go to give them a drink and you notice they've got food pocketed in their mouth, they're not clearing it well, could be a sign of oral motor deficits. When they're eating, you see a lot of hard swallows, their eyes get red and they water when they're swallowing, or after a meal, you hear kind of a gunky, like <clears throat> they're clearing their throat a lot or they're coughing. Um, that can be an indication of not managing food well. If you think there's an oral motor deficit, your next step kind of depends on where you are in the country and also how old your child is. OT can do oral motor. Speech therapists can do oral motor. It depends on the setting and it also depends on how old your child is. So your next step would be to figure out where you would go, whether it's an outpatient clinic or if, you're young, if your child is young enough, in-home therapy with early intervention. And then out, just asking the question, um, I think there's an oral motor deficit, who would I get an evaluation with, OT or speech? And they'd be able to tell you right away over the phone, one way or the other. So the next underlying cause for picky eating is some sort of gastrointestinal medical reason. If there's an underlying issue with the tummy, the intestines, swallowing, that is going to make the child not feel great, therefore start to re restrict and reduce how much food they eat. Logically in their little brains, they don't have the ability to say, let's say for example, reflux. Oh, when I eat mandarin oranges, I don't feel good because of the acid level in it. Instead, they might say any orange food is bad. They don't have the logic to say this food, that food, good, bad. They just know they don't feel good. So they start to equate certain foods with not feeling great, whether it's logical or not, and start to restrict their diet. Reflux is a big one with babies. The fact that they are just generally don't have great muscle tone because they're floppy little babies, um, that also is true for their internal muscles. So food is more easily lifted from the stomach up through the esophagus. That's why babies spit up. There are some other indicators besides vomiting that reflux is happening. Arching when they're eating or shortly after eating, arching their back sort of out of nowhere screams or or like pain, yelling. You're like, what the, where did that come from? If you're holding your child or you're near them, you might hear kind of like a little tiny something come up and then they swallow it. Frequent swallowing after a meal or after they sit up. A constant runny nose, constant ear infections, just a gunky, sounding like, oh, my child always has a cold. Not saying they have reflux, but that can happen with silent reflux because there's always something coming up and it gets stuck in those passages and it causes other problems. If they are more grumpy in the morning, right when they wake up because they've been laying down, so the acid is more likely to run up and down. They don't wanna eat in the morning. They're like not interested in food until halfway through the day. Could be a sign of reflux. We're gonna talk about poop for a minute. Constipation and diarrhea are not normal. I mean, just because your doctor says it's not that bad doesn't mean it's good either. If you have a child struggling with constipation, maybe your doctor suggests Miralax or some kind of stool softener. That is a great example of 
treating the symptom, giving a Band-Aid, and not figuring out why it's happening in the first place. It could be an intolerance or sensitivity to food. Um, it could be something else. So if we just give Miralax until they literally can't hold it anymore, sure, they're not constipated, but who's to say that won't come back in a month? Being uncomfortable is uncomfortable. No one wants to have those kinds of bathroom issues. And if you feel a certain way after you eat, it's only going to start making that relationship, again, maybe not super logically, but I eat, I don't feel good, therefore I don't want to eat. One thing that I have done in my household um, personally is incorporate prebiotics and probiotics into my diet and my kids' diets. If you're interested in learning what supplements I personally use with my family, just send a message or a comment because I'm happy to share. Prebiotics and probiotics support that natural gut microbiome, which supports your brain. Not all probiotics are created equal though, so do your due diligent research when you're looking into supplements. Your next step here, I highly recommend looking into whether something else is going on in their body. If nothing else, it crosses that off. Have a conversation with your doctor and look into whether an allergist or a gastroenterologist a GI doctor would be a viable option. These next four reasons will take a little bit more effort um, and the recommendations will not come today because this video would be an hour long. They will come next week. So make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell so then you'll get an email when next week's video comes out. The third reason behind picky eating is that the child has not had enough exposure to a variety of foods. If a child is not interested or even resists interacting with a new food on the first, second, third try, don't abandon ship. Um, if they only interact or see the foods that they know, then they will only interact with and eat the foods that they know. And it can take, I've said this in another video, but it can take multiple, 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 multiple presentations of a new food before it is accepted into a diet completely. So just because they don't try it, or even if they do and they don't like it, don't say, well, we tried it and never go back to it again. One big thing that I totally relate to with this is presenting food to a child and then they want nothing to do with it and you end up throwing it out. So if you want recommendations on a good size of food to present for exposure, um, I highly recommend Kids Eat in Color. She had a little Instagram post, I, I wanna say yesterday, where she talked about how, yeah, she wants her kids to eat red peppers, but she's not gonna plop down three big sticks of green pepper or red pepper on their plate. If it's a brand new food they've never experienced before, the exposure to that food may come in the size of like your pinky nail. Just having it on their plate is step one. Check out Kids Eat in Color. Her blog is wonderful. And she is a registered dietitian. The fourth reason that we may inadvertently be cultivating a picky eater is that we teach our kids that mess is bad and that food is messy. So they then make the assumption that food is bad. When we are constantly wiping, scraping, removing any form of mess, then we are teaching our kids that that's not okay. Um, if we're not letting them try to touch and explore foods, um, then they are not ever going to get the experience to do that. So again, this is not a I'm gonna do this so my kid is a picky eater, but when you do not allow them to touch, mush, squish, poke, play with their food, they're not going to do that and they're not going to want to have food on their hands. You're gonna see hands up here um, and it just equates food as mess, mess is bad, food is bad. Number five is that they are not given enough opportunity to self-feed. So contrary to popular belief, you do not need to wait until a certain age to let your child self-feed. They can start doing it as soon as you start giving them solid foods. Will it be clean? No. Will it be effective? Probably not. They're not going to be able to scoop a spoonful of baby food and get it in their mouth 
the first time or even the 20th time. But if we push their hands away when they are reaching for the spoon, when they're reaching to touch the food, if we push their hands away, we're robbing them of that experience, basically. Now, if your child has a predisposition or there's already some other um, sensory aversions or things going on, this can just exacerbate it. So the final thing that can impact, number six, that can impact picky eating is a lack of routine. I feel like this comes up a lot with kids who are just generally uninterested in food. We as parents think that having access to food all the time will help them eat more. We're thinking they're not gonna sit at the table and eat with us, so we need to make sure they're eating something so we allow them to graze all day. Let's think about what happens to the stomach. Let's take a little two-year-old who does not wanna sit at the table, does not wanna interact with food, but will eat goldfish and they will eat other snack foods. So mom puts a bowl of snacky foods on the table. Child plays for a little bit, comes over, grabs five goldfish, walks away, plays a little bit, comes back, eats uh, six Cheez-Its, goes away, plays some more, comes back. If we're doing that all day, then what's happening is your stomach is saying, I'm, I'm kind of hungry. The child comes over, gives it five or six things. The stomach says, okay, that's cool, go play. I'm kind of hungry, five or six things, okay, I'm good. So your stomach and that child is not getting the opportunity to expand when it is full and then contract when it is hungry. So these kids do not have a routine. They don't have a good cycle because their bodies never have to feel really hungry and they don't know what it feels like to feel full. In adults, if we eat snacks all day, we tend to still eat our three meals. We just also eat snacks. In kids, it's actually the opposite. Kids tend to eat less when they graze all day and don't eat their meals because their stomachs don't expand and contract the way that they should. Therefore, they do not feel hungry and they do not feel full. Another common things with, with the lack of routine is they, they may rely heavily on drinks. Um, if you've got a big milk drinker, let's think of it this way. If you drank a milkshake like 20 minutes before it was time to sit down for a meal, you probably wouldn't eat that much because your stomach is still gonna be full of milkshake. So in a little kid, their stomachs are small. If they're drinking a full cup of milk, even if it's only 2% milk, but especially if it's whole milk, guess what? They're not gonna wanna eat because that is a ton for a little stomach to handle. I've said this in my sippy cup video, kids don't need access to liquids all day. You don't need to have a sippy cup in every room. If you have a routine of three meals, and then two to three snacks, depending on how long they're awake, if you do a bedtime snack or not, if you offer liquid at that time, they're gonna have enough throughout their day. Now, obviously, if they are thirsty, give them something to drink. If they ask for, they say, I'm thirsty, give them some water. But giving that scheduled routine of expected snacks and meals, they should be hydrated enough and they should have enough to drink that they don't need to have a sippy cup with them everywhere they go. Can I say it again? You as the parent are not the reason for your child's picky eating, but there are things you can do to support it and there are things that you can do to just exacerbate it. So that's what part two is gonna focus on. Whether you've identified picky eater or not, or you're just hoping to prevent it, tune in next week again. Subscribe, hit the bell, uh, join me on Instagram. That seems to be where I am most of the time now. Um, I do have a Facebook group, but that's a little bit more quiet. So Instagram, um, and you can sign up for my email list if you're interested in that as well. So check it out in the description box and I'll see you guys next week for part two in the mini series within a series. <sighs> There's too much going on. I'll see you guys later.